if you're genuinely frustrated with the amount of money you're making today and you keep trying to do the same thing everybody else is doing, definition of insanity, expecting a different outcome, seeing more patients is never going to get you to independence and financial freedom. It's just you can't. There's not enough hours in the day. I am Tony Maritato and our lovely host, Dave Kittle. Dave, how are you doing this morning? Tony, I'm feeling great. Good morning. Good morning. I see you got your paper cup, keeping that coffee hot. I love it. Keeping it hot. We've got plenty more. It's going to be a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get feedback here. Okay. I just muted my YouTube. Um, man, lots of stuff going on. So I, I was curious, before we even get into the episode, like where people talk about your media consumption, my media consumption. One of the things that people ask me all the time is they're like, you're so productive. You're so busy. How do you get so much done? And it's funny because it, it must be what people perceive versus the reality. The reality is I don't feel like I do that much um, to give people a perspective on my routine day like today. I'm with you. You, this is the first kind of formal business thing I'm doing today. Started at 8.30. Uh, I woke up at 6.30, made lunch for my kids. They take lunch to school. Got the dogs fed. We're dog sitting. My brother-in-law's dog, um, you know, had coffee with my wife, like catching up on the day. Uh, my wife then takes the boys, like gets them ready, gets all their supplies, takes them to school, does all that stuff. And then once I finish with you, I've got four new patient evaluations. I've got a podcast scheduled for one o'clock that I'm going to be recording and publishing hopefully today or tomorrow. And then I'm kind of done. Like then my afternoon is open by this evening. Uh, my wife's going to take one of the boys for a volleyball game. I'm going to take two of the boys for a baseball game. My oldest is going to be busy with theater stuff and volleyball. Uh, then we have dinner and go to bed. <laughs> what is a day like for you? I mean, especially now with a newborn in the house. Oh, uh, man. Uh, I'm only seeing two clients right now. Um, one is like three times a week, and one's been kind of like once a week, uh, some vertigo. So it's really, I, I even kind of raised my prices to kind of try to get them to say no, and they still said yes at, at, at 350 visits. So, um, Anyway, I'm seeing a few visits. Uh, I have some of these, view, you know, Zoom calls with you. Some of my other scheduled uh, podcast episodes that I recorded like three, four weeks ago. Those are coming out. Um, it's it, it's been a lot of just downtime with the baby and kind of learning this whole routine and um, organizing the overnights and the hours and the feeding and all that type of stuff. Um, but I have to work out every day. I typically yeah. have been working out around like. 6 7 8 p.m and i'm fine with that because sometimes if i go hard like my arms or my grip and all that like my my nervous system shot so like i'm more of a, a late night exerciser uh, i've been running a little bit that all that helps uh, i would strongly recommend it and i would say that i'm trying to do a little bit more of what i believe you do with social media and what i mean by that tony is i'll do stories like on instagram and facebook whatever and i've noticed it's not a big deal but i've noticed that Tony Maritato never looks at my stories. Now that go, probably goes back into your productivity of you go on social media, you have a post or an idea or something, you post it. And you, I, I'm assuming you kind of got, you kind of get off. You don't lurk, yeah. you don't scroll, all of that. And that is why people think, oh my gosh, Tony, you're, you're, you're having all these multiple posts a day and all this. And they're putting uh, you in, in their shoes of like the infinite scrolling and all that type of stuff. And that's why I think people are asking you like, how do you have time for this and that and all that? Um, so I've been trying to do more of that of like, I'm organizing posts and content and all that, but like trying to get off those platforms, you know, we're catching up on billing and stuff like that for the patient side. That's pretty much it. Um, definitely have, have a, a different sleep schedule and uh, that, that's pretty much it. Nothing too crazy, I guess. Now you're right. I did forget. I do try to get a three to five, sometimes seven mile run in. Uh, probably about five or six days a week right now. And, and that's when I do my media consumption. So that's when I'll get my first million podcast. That's when I'll listen to the Dave Kittle show. That's when I'll, you know, consume content that helps me learn. I never listen to music. Same thing when I'm driving. I'll just get in, I'll hit play, I'll drive where I need to go. I'm consuming 
media that is educational. Uh, I found a couple new podcasts that I totally love. I was listening to an interview with the guy who invented Google Docs. He now works for Microsoft and like just listening to how his brain works. I was listening to an interview with um, several CEOs that were born in India, came to the U.S. It's just an incredible story. There are so many high level tech CEOs that originally were born in India. So so. I do that during my drives and during my workouts, but yeah, I just, I just, I think I'm more efficient too. You know, like my camera's always set up. I, I flip it on and hit record. I record the content one take. I don't meet, I don't usually edit. I don't usually do any post-production stuff. You get what you get. Something published is better than nothing at all. And if I tried to wait for it to be perfect, nothing would come out. Let's can, talk. A, go ahead. Can I, real quick. Can I double click on what you just said about, media consumption versus like music yeah so when i'm working out i will i i do have music like something upbeat like if if i'm running i'll run you know five miles it takes me about 35 to 45 something minutes something like that um when i run i might do like half podcast media half uh music if i'm working out weights it's usually it's mostly music outside of that i try not to listen to music at all when i'm driving uh, you know, with the with the hands free, you plug your phone in, whatever. It's YouTube or it's an audiobook or podcast, whatever. That there's people that like want to be more successful and do more things and all that, but then they consume like a ridiculous amount of music. And you know this, none of this music will help you, your your family, your financial freedom, your bank account. None of that. None of this music, none of these songs that you memorize the lyrics to for all these years um, help. They don't help you. Um, but that is something that. I don't know if I got that from you or just, but if you look at folks that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year or millions or whatever, most likely they're, they're more likely going to be either not, not doing like not listening to music endlessly, or they're learning. Like you said, they're reading books or they're listening to audiobooks, podcasts, media, whatever, YouTube, whatever, whatever it might be. So maybe that's just a quick little tip, which is like, you know, maybe look at yourself, your, your consumption, your iPhone should be able to tell you like what apps you're using and all that. And don't make any excuses around that because everyone can listen to less music. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. My kids look at their utilization on their phones all the time and they, they, without any prompting for me, thankfully, they're always striving to bring the utilization down. It's one of the things they gave up for land. Like they're, they're very conscious. And I wonder if that's a generational thing, you know, as, as, future generations come into this world, are they going to be more acutely aware that we need some moderation in that? But that being said, let's jump into the main topic that I wanted to talk about, which is Caitlin Clark. And for context, so she was the Iowa basketball player, NCAA. She did amazing, broke all these records. Then she graduated, went into the draft. And I've got some numbers. So she was top round pick for the draft WNBA. She signed a four year contract for $338,000. That's less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. But the big news is she signed a Nike contract for eight years and it was $28 million, which is $3 million a year. So I don't follow that, but I started seeing these posts in my media stream and I shared them because I was like, this is what more therapists need to see. This is what we need to think about. It's like her main gig would be playing basketball WNBA. She barely makes enough money to survive on that. She, But her side gig, which would be a Nike ambassador representative, $3 million a year. You know, 20, what did I say? $28 million in total. The side gig is what pays for the lifestyle and everything else. And of course, got a little bit of hate from the physical therapy community. But before we get into it, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, really quick, uh, without without getting in trouble, first of all, um, you know, the WNBA is newer. Um, the NBA and these other leagues, the NFL, you know, have been around for what, 60, 80, 100 something years. So the WNBA is a newer league. There's total less viewership. There's total less ticket sales. That's why the total dollar amount is less for the first round, first overall pick for the WNBA right now, even though she's like the biggest star 
ever. She was on Saturday Saturday Night Live. So uh, recently, and um, in terms of the the numbers, I mean, you know, it is what it is. Like that is what the league is garnering in terms of ticket sales, merchandise sales, ad dollars, you know, TV rights, contracts, all that type of stuff. So that's my initial, you know, my initial thoughts on it. Obviously, we can go deeper. Yeah, let's go deeper. Since you brought it up, the I'm looking on Google right now. So it says the guy didn't even say the name of the guy. And I don't know the name, but the guy who is the number round draft pick for NBA in 2023, his four year contract was worth 55 million. So 338,000 compared to 55 million. But like you said, the money isn't in the WNBA and this applies to our profession. You know, one of the comments, maybe two of the comments were like, have you ever given a physical therapist an eight figure contract? I was like, no, because I don't have a business that generates 10 figures that justifies me giving an eight figure contract. You know, I already give as much as the business will allow me to give. It's not a personal choice. It is a business decision. If I gave an eight figure contract, I'd have no business. So just, you know, yes, the NBA is generating billions of dollars, I would imagine. Um, the revenue is there for it. As the WNBA improves, grows, gains popularity, gets more money into its budget, those contracts are going to go up. Yeah, 100%. So I guess the, you know, the, the crux of this is like, how can we, uh, I mean, you you gave the analogy around Caitlin Clark situation and physical therapy. So like, what are some initial thoughts around how, you know, therapists like, you know, Instagram accounts grow YouTube channel. Uh, we talked about other things like companies sending you products to do reviews, all that, but like, how could a therapist even come closer to that type of uh, a percentage split? Let's say, you know, they're making, I don't know, 80, 90, hundred K somewhere in the U S as a full-time physical therapist, but they want to make, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars or potentially even a million or two. Um, how, how could that be possible? Like you'd have to basically uh, deliver a lot more value to the corporate, you know, the ATI, the USPH, the select medical, whatever. So like, I don't know, is that even possible? Um, or is it really around like your own practice, your own business? You have to kind of do things differently. You have to do things different. You have to look at, okay, how have people done it already? Right. And, and I've shared these examples, but Athlean X, that's a YouTube channel. I don't remember the physical therapist name, but I have to imagine he's doing upwards of 10 to 20 million a year between his YouTube channel with over a million subscribers, multi, maybe 10 million subscribers, product endorsements, paid memberships. He has multiple upstream services that he's selling. Then you've got Bob and Brad. Again, they have to be doing at least $10 million between the channel, product endorsements, equity deals. I don't know about Ask Dr. Joe, Tone and, Tone and Titan, I think is another one. There, there's multiple examples. That's just from YouTube, and that's because I understand the YouTube world. But like you said, you go where the opportunity is. If I only ever want to treat sweet, wonderful, amazing little geriatrics that are living on a fixed income, I can never expect to generate a seven or eight figure deal. But then you look at, and, and this is where I've been spending a lot of my time recently, we've got associates that have moved into tech. You know, and so you look at what multiple tech companies are doing and tech companies are getting funded. And I was doing research on Y Combinator. When they fund a company, they put 500,000 into that company, hoping that some of those companies are going to run into the hundreds of millions. One is going to run into the billions, you know, but the idea is we see this explosion. You know, I've been talking a ton about AI scribes, AI assisted documentation. We see this uh, Hinge Health, I've been watching a bunch of the content coming out from them. If a therapist wanted that kind of deal, that's where the money is. Start doing things in that space, connect with those companies. I'm shocked, and I want to hear your perspective. I'm shocked at how little the engineers and the developers in that space actually know about what we do. And they're the ones, they're brilliant, but they're generating products for what they think we want. This is where, and I, I talked to somebody about this just the other day, it's not published yet. I think the real value of the arbitrage here is you've got computer engineers that are brilliant. 
creating products. You've got physical therapists that are brilliant delivering service. There is no one who can make the connection that can speak the physical therapy language, can talk to our genuine pain points, can understand our insecurities. That's what's going to sell and, and what we're trying to do and convey that to the engineers that are actually building the products that could solve our problems. What, before I go on, what, what are your thoughts on that? That was a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's why, I mean, I, I kind of put my hat in the ring and, 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 you know, swung the bat with my tech startup initial. And, uh, I thought I, you know, I, I ultimately, I did not have product market fit. I had kind of like a feature or a benefit, but not like a, you know, a true, true product that had product market fit. That I, how, I, that how would you judge product market fit? Like what's your metric to say that you have it? I don't think there's a metric. It's like, my when I okay so when we had software bugs uh you might have been using it at the time I can't recall but we had you know practice owners using it and there was so bad of software bugs that like it was basically like not usable and you know like a bunch of owners were pausing uh their monthly recurring payments with us and I'll, also then I was trying to save face and I was like practically reaching out to all the other owners and saying like, Hey, we're going to pause your payments because like literally the app doesn't work. Like it would be like paying for, you know, you know, cable and your cable doesn't work. It's just like crazy. So, um, it was a challenge. I kind of, I kind of lost my train of thought, but like, um, jump back in. Give me a second. Yeah. So, so for me, when I'm looking at product market fit, one of the main well, indicators that I'm looking for is, are people like reaching out? So is it more inbound than outbound? I don't I don't want to be convincing them why this is so amazing. I want them reaching out to me. And I, I literally want people offering me money. Like, look, I, I will pay for this. I just want this service, this product, access to this, whatever. So yeah, my bad. Product market fit, when, I, when we had the software bugs and I was reaching out to the owners to say, hey, we're pausing your payments, all that. Then at some point it was like challenge. It was a challenge, and I was like at a crossroads. The software developer of mine, my partner, was kind of like not able to fix his own software bugs, and I was at this crossroads of like, all right, is he going to exit the company? Am I going to either have to get a new partner or spend more money out of pockets for a design and development shop to kind of like fix everything? Right. So I was at this crossroads of like, do I continue to invest money in it, um, or do I walk away? And I had some owners, I had some customers uh, begging me to continue. But I did not have enough to truly, truly in my gut feel, I did not have enough of these owners begging me to continue. I had some, which was, that made it challenging. I wish it was, I wish it was, you know, if it was zero, then it's like, all right, like, obviously this is something that people like don't really need or whatever. But I had, I had owners that like had it on their website, like to market it and all this stuff. So I had some uh, customers that were begging me to continue. Product market fit would be like, if you cut off the service right now, You'd have like for you with your course with with learn Medicare billing, like, let's just say if you were going to like, hey, I'm going to moonlight this course or I'm going to get rid of it, you whatever you have access to, you have access to, but like any new people, uh, I'm stopping it today. And if you had like dozens of people today message you or email you like, hey, Tony, can you do one more cohort? I can you you know, I, I want to get in. I heard great things and I kind of I procrastinated. I didn't do it before, but I really want to do it before you truly are done with this product or service, or in this case, the, your course. So you need to have some, it, it's not really an objective measure. It's like some gut feel or some percentage, maybe over 50% of your customer base. If you cut off the product or service, would they be begging you to continue? And that's kind of like what some of like the tech world and Y Combinator and some of those kind of use a little bit around uh, product market fit. I, maybe there are some objective measures, but that's kind of like the I don't know, like the abstract measurement of product market fit. If you cut off the product or service, do you have people, you know, almost protesting or demanding that you continue, you find a way to continue because they love the service so much. Yeah. Seth Godin talks about if you, you know, stopped producing content tomorrow, would anybody care? Would they be looking for you? Um, when I think about, and I'd love to hear your perspective, because you were in that world, uh, I wonder how much of, some of the challenge was you weren't a tech, quote, the tech founder. You were not the engineer. You weren't the one creating the product. So you were dependent on builders. And, you know, the builders, you were paying them, I assume, to build, but it wasn't their bill. It wasn't their dream, their vision. Um, I wonder if that's different. Like if 
the builder is building and now they bring you the therapist in as a consultant, maybe an advisor, maybe you come with uh, a, an equity deal that's there. I think that's different because they have the technical skills, the technical know-how, they can fix the problems. I also wonder like if you were to go back knowing what you know now, because you're a very different human today than you were then, what are some of the things that you might have changed or some of the things you might have done different? Because there are so many therapists that have amazing product ideas right now. They want to go that direction, whether it's a digital product, physical product, anything like that. And, and I think it would benefit them to hear your perspective on going back completely impartial today and being like, oh, I should have done this or I could have done that. What would be something you would say? Uh, what I learned at, for physical therapy specifically is that the medical record, the electronic medical record, even though it's a very robust piece of software, that is the mission critical piece of software. What I would tell myself looking back is you have to create something mission critical. So if like Venetia was not, it was like an ancillary, nice to have, but it was not really needed. Um, an EMR with schedule, documentation, billing, claims, revenue cycle management, that piece of software is mission critical. These other apps and things around remote therapeutic monitoring or any other you know, side apps, um, potentially even what you're working on until it gets integrated with a medical record, but even any AI app arguably at this point is not mission critical. Now, mm -hmm. if you get consumers, customers, practice owners, therapists using it and they get obsessed with it and they love it and they don't wanna document or they don't wanna go to work a day without it, then now it does kind of become mission critical uh, or closer to being mission critical. But if you cut off, like you see it all the time in these Facebook groups, when someone had like WebPT is down for two hours or a day or whatever, and people flip out and they write in every Facebook group, like my WebPT is down, I can't get in, I can't, our therapist can't write notes, which it is a frustration for those practice owners. So that's proof that it's a mission critical piece of software. If the AI app that you're talking about goes down for a day or two, are people posting in Facebook groups about it? Probably not, maybe in the future, Right. Now, what's interesting, though, about your situation, I remember these conversations you and I had. Um, nobody was really talking about HIPAA compliance. Nobody was really talking about like, I'm just texting patients and, and the vulnerabilities in that and the potential lawsuits and, and everything. I would and, and EMRs, I don't think and you knew better than me. I don't think EMRs at that time had texting functionality that was HIPAA compliant. So I would say your product would be mission critical. If I wanted to text clients, I had no other way to do it through a HIPAA compliant platform. There might've been competitors, but I don't think the EMRs at that time were offering that kind of functionality. So, um, it, you know, it, it's, yes, it needs to be mission critical. We need pa patients to, or customers to need it, but we also need them to know that they need it we need them to, to see, and, and this is where I think we step into that space, therapists, we're influencers, whether we have a TikTok channel or a YouTube channel or a podcast, we are influencers. And as tech companies start to realize that, I think that there's going to be some amazing partnerships that are coming out of this because when I step into a project and I start working something, my main goal is... I want to share the process. I want to share the build. I want to show other people and you guys see it, how I'm using it. And if I do that correctly, that company doesn't even have to have sales calls. They don't have to pay for, you know, affiliate links and commissions, all this stuff. People see me using a particular tool or product or whatever, and they want to buy it because they've already seen me using it. They understand how it works. And I kind of fast track them through all of that frustration. And I think therapists can do that for fitness products. We talked about something like a tonal, which is a three or $4,000 exercise device that goes into the house. Therapists could start using that, become the influencer choice for a product like that. I don't know that they could get an equity deal with tonal, but I definitely think they could get a significant boost in income. Peloton, um, didn't Joe Rogan, I don't remember what the product that he connected with, I want to say Onyx or Onyx, one, yeah. what is it? On it. Yeah. The, the, supplement. yeah, you know, that was a huge, huge thing for him. Um, so that's where I think therapists pull eight figure deals. They can still do therapy and they can still love therapy. It's a hell heck of a lot easier 
for me to love treating my favorite little geriatric when I've got a six figure, seven figure, eight figure deal sitting in the bank doing something else, you know? So, so what are, what are some brands, right? So like, would it be like biofreeze? Would it be like some therapy type brands or it's, you know, it's Nike, it's Lululemon. Like what, what are some brands? Um, like you see some of these physical therapists, DBT, you know, influencers and like they'll on their Instagram, for example, they'll put like in their profile, like whatever their code is for like 10% off or 15% off at one of these brands or whatever. But like, I don't know, like, you're not going to make a huge amount doing that. I don't think like even, you know, what are you making like tens or hundreds of dollars? Like who cares? Like, right. You're talking about something way bigger. Right. Um, yeah. So if someone, if, if someone had a big audience, like, let, let's say like, um, maybe, I mean, Greg Todd might be a stretch because he's certainly unique and I'm not saying everyone could do that, but like, you know, he does have a big audience, a big reach. He's been doing content for years from at least 2015, if not before that. And you know, he has medical record companies come to him and all these other companies and, you know, therapists could position themselves like that to say, you know, rather than giving me some, you know, little rinky dink affiliate link, I, I would, I would love, you know, a percentage point or two or whatever, or, you know, vesting equity over time, maybe, you know, three to 5%, um, for someone like Greg Todd, who then in front of his audience can just naturally mention the way that Joe Rogan did with on it. And he would mention the supplements and he would say he's taking this or that, or he would have the supplements kind of position at the table during his YouTube video filmings or whatever. So someone like Greg Todd could, you know, mention what medical record that he loves using or what his practices are using, um, any other services or products like health and wellness type stuff, uh, potentially. Um, yeah. I think you, I think you just like when you're talking about patients, you look at what, how much money is behind the individual patient, right? If, if you're going to see a patient for $500 a session, well, $500 can't mean the difference between paying my rent, paying, buying food and groceries or, you know, hiring Dave Kittle. $500 means I don't even notice that 500 is gone, but I have the outcome and the benefit of a session with you. So when I look at brands throughout the market, right, you look at a company like TheraBrand, they're a band. And I don't know what their market cap is. I don't know what kind of budgets they have. They've been around forever. They're a pretty legacy company. I, I They're not going to be a company that I would assume is comfortable with equity deals. They don't want to give up any of that. I had a great conversation with a company, two founders. They struggled. They built it from scratch. They own everything. Those guys are not going to give up any equity in their company. This is their baby. It's like you telling me I can own a pinky from your son, right? It's never going to happen. But then you go to companies that have YC funding or other venture capital. These guys are just getting money like all over the place. They're going to offer and they have, you know, vested interest, equity, 1%, 2%. They don't even blink an eye about it. Because it's not something that they struggle, there's no sweat equity in it, and they already have huge budgets. So that's where I would look at that. One, I'd look at the market cap of the company, something like Peloton, they're not going to give me a uh, equity deal, but they're going to give me some serious commissions and sales. Uh, a startup that has no customers that I can genuinely bring an audience that I, I believe in the product and I know it's going somewhere, but it's starting with zero. Uh, but they have funding, that's an equity deal just waiting to happen. And, and so you have to do you have to do a little research. And I think we all want to be genuine. It has to be something you genuinely like, use, believe in. And let's say you get in early at one of these companies that offer you, you know, 1%, 3 5%, depending on you, your value, all that type of stuff, depending on their funding, their their finances, all that. One of those companies, let's say it's the AI app or the AI company that I think you kind of mentioned you're working with and that's all I'll say, but let's say they blow up, right? Like that could become your eight figure yeah. thing, right? You have your current practice. Um, but, but this, you know, like the whole Caitlin Clark thing to kind of tie it back in, like your current situation, Tony could be the, the first part of Caitlin Clark's deal, which is like the WNBA salary type thing, even though you're doing very well and you have a practice and you know, you guys are have patience and you know, you're, you're busy. Um, but if you have a few percentage points of this company and let's say it's like the next AI app that like gets used by, you know, every practice, every medical and physical therapy and other, you know, other therapy practices across the country, 
it could blow up. And then your vested interest in that could now become that seven or eight figure dollar amount, you know, deal or, uh, or, or not, in, not even investment, your, your eight figure deal over time. Yeah. I mean, how many times do we see it? I'm sure Kate, Caitlin Clark, when she was seven and eight years old, pro pro probably playing club basketball, was just like all the other girls. You know, every one of them was out. They were having fun. They were having a good time. They wanted to get better, but more they wanted to socialize with their friends. Uh, nobody, nobody in this world could have looked at an eight year old Caitlin Clark and been like, you're going to get a twenty eight million dollar deal with Nike one day. But it happened. And, and all the other girls, and I understand this is where the frustration, I think, for therapists comes in. All the other little girls were, wanted it just as much, worked just as hard, put in just as much effort. All the parents did all the same travel and all the other things, but it didn't happen for them. you know. And so a lot of the responses I got on my original post was that this is an outlier. You can't rely on that. My thing is, if it happens once, it can happen again. You know, and, and why are we so fast to say this will never happen for me or this will never happen for you? It's happened. It is possible to happen. So I, I still say um, if you want to be a physical therapist with longevity, you want to protect that passion for what you do. Awesome. Do it by getting, you know, these opportunities in front of you, don't close the door, don't think it's impossible because it can and does happen. Yeah, Let, let's just review and clarify the, again, the example of what potentially we could do as therapists with the Caitlin Clark deal. So you got the, you know, arguably the low salary, those dollars coming from the WNBA for her salary, for the five figure or six figure deal or whatever. And then you have the eight figure deal. Like you said, the money is coming from Nike because you know, they're a public company. They're huge. They're a multi-billion dollar company. They have a lot of finances. They have a lot of, they have a lot of capital. Um, so for a physical therapist, for just a review. Now we talked about your salary or, you know, your, the, the corporate or the practice, the private practice is paying you your salary. These other ideas or these other options are the money is going to come from where they're going to come from, probably not the corporates you're saying. So it's, it's coming from these bigger companies. So it's kind of coming from a, a Nike equivalent of whoever would want to play in the physical therapy and healthcare space. Right. 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 It's going to be from those future companies that we don't know. I mean, look, there's, there's a hundred AI scribes out there right now. All of them have similar basic structure they're, they're not hugely different. Some of them are more integrated to certain EMRs than others. Um, but the reality is nobody can pick the right one. Nobody would have said Facebook is going to, you know, disrupt my space. Like we have no idea how many photo sharing apps were there when Instagram was started, yet Instagram was the chosen one that grew into what it is today. So the idea is there's a little bit of a gamble there. We're planting a lot of seeds. We're, we're kind of figuring out where we resonate with, what's important to us. And ultimately, it goes back to the money isn't nev is never as important as personal joy, satisfaction, our ethics, all of those things. But if, if you're genuinely frustrated with the amount of money you're making today and you keep trying to do the same thing everybody else is doing, definition of insanity, expecting a different outcome, Seeing more patients is never going to get you to independence and financial freedom. It's just you can't. There's not enough hours in the day. So that's where you have to start exploring. And I always love to see what has been successful before. And is this something that I can model and learn from and, you know, pull those ideas? So, yeah, I would say first place, biggest opportunity right now. Look in the tech world. Look at tech startups. Look at what companies are starting today right now y combinator puts out a list of all of their uh, companies and their batches and things that they're looking for and even though i'm not a tech i'm not an engineer i'm not somebody who's going to build a digital product i am somebody who can bring genuine value every watching person watching this can bring genuine value to a company like that and, and they are hungry for the knowledge that's inside of our heads our experiences yeah, you, you have, and just like I do, but you definitely have the domain expertise that they don't have. They might have the money, the technical know-how, but you have the domain expertise, which is in some cases very valuable. If someone's a new grad, 
or they're not Tony Maritato, you know, that's the free market system. They might not be as valuable, but Tony absolutely is significantly more valuable than a lot of therapists because of your, what you tinker with, what you're interested in, uh, what you put out, right? All that type of stuff. You get these opportunities. That's another thing is, you know, you put, you put content out there. Um, So another way, like we kind of mentioned it before on other episodes, but like, that's why you and I have been advocating and, you know, we're not selling anything per se, but like we're advocating for leveraging certain things, right? So leveraging either software or media, you know, we talked about videos. Um, What are some other things that they can potentially leverage to kind of get this uh, second bite of the Caitlin Clark deal, the second bite of the Apple, uh, the the bigger part of the deal. So leveraging software, uh, so, so code or software, media, which would be videos, audio, that type of stuff, um, you know, human, human capital. So they hire, th- they hire therapists, they grow a practice, they expand that way. But, you know, th- there's some constraints there and there's pros and cons with either way. What are some other ideas around like things that they can leverage to potentially get there? Yeah, I think you said it. you're leveraging time, you're leveraging work, you're leveraging finance. You know, those are really the things where so I have access to capital. The venture capitalists have access to capital. They need to put it to work somewhere. They need to do something. Do I have time? Am I a student? When I was a student, I had boatloads of time. So when I was a student, I was doing things to earn money because I had more time than money. I didn't have other resources. Right now, I leverage my my business opportunity as the platform. It puts money in my bank. Not a lot, but enough that allows me the free time to do these other things. We all have a competitive advantage, even to the point where, you know, I I know we touch on some some topics. We talked about women and not uh, income inequity, Uh, but like even in terms of heritage, nationality, like when I was in South Florida, you know, we had we had individuals from Cuba. We had individuals from Haiti. Um, leveraging your heritage to connect with your community and to deliver a value to that specific population that is unique to their culture. I love the conversation that's happening around artificial intelligence right now, uh, open source models and trying to get them to match specific cultures. So you've got AI in Russia that should match the Russian culture. AI in China that should match the Chinese culture. AI in the US that should match the US culture. Um, On a very small scale, it's it's the same thing with anything that we wanna do. I don't see anything wrong with creating a business, physical therapy service that matches the culture of a specific demographic of client. It doesn't have to be geography. It, It could be anything like my kids in theater. There is a culture around theater. My other kids in volleyball, there's a culture around volleyball, you know? So uh, you find what is uniquely yours. Nobody, there is no person better at being Dave Kittle than Dave Kittle. So you find that, you leverage that, you you use uh, technology to get that out there. That's That's where it is. Right on, awesome. Let's talk about a YouTube channel that I found. And I, I don't know if you got a chance to go check it out. But when we talk about nobody can be, which one? Is it the plumber? Uh, the plumber and the baker. I want to talk about the baker real quick. Oh, the baker, yeah, about the attitude or enthusiasm, yeah. what you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just his personality. So just like I said, nobody could be a better Dave Kittle than Dave Kittle. This guy, um, Louis Gantis, Louis Gantis, he, his whole thing, I looked up his channel because I watch his shorts all the time. I love his shorts. They're hilarious. He's got 1.2 million scribes. He only has two long form videos. Everything is short form video, 172 short form video. His channel has 817 million total views. He comes on every single short that he does is like, I am going to bake the hardest things possible to show people that baking is easy. But he doesn't do it from, hey, this is awesome. Come join me. He does it from like belittling bakers. Bakers make such a big deal about how difficult baking is. I'm going to do it. I'm not even going to have any formal training. I'm going to show you you're full of S because baking is easy. And his attitude and his cleverness and everything is so hilarious. I would love, I mean, it stands out up from all the other baking channels. Did you, and it doesn't matter if you saw it. Did you get a chance to see any of his content? 
I, I saw the one you posted yesterday we, that you tagged me um, about the uh, something Apple. What was the? Oh, the maybe. I, yeah, I remember. I don't remember exactly, but. Poison apple, like a fake poison apple or something yeah, like that, right? Yeah, and then yeah. the candy coating shell and he yep. like uses yep. ingredients he has and, and he just makes it look. And it reminds me of so many in our profession who take what they do so deeply seriously when in fact, if you look at the clinical research, the outcomes are no better than sham or placebo, you know? And so when I look at that and you and I've had these conversations, I'm like, everything's sham and placebo. I, I can get a placebo benefit from exercise. I can get a placebo benefit from surgery. Uh, Mark Cagella just came out with a great interview where somebody was saying that there isn't even a placebo benefit to surgery. There is zero benefit to a lot of the surgeries. Um, so I just feel like so many of us take what we do so deeply seriously, it has stopped being a science and turned into a religion. And I would love so much to see somebody come into the PT space with this kind of belligerent attitude and just knock down everybody. I don't have the research chops and the background to really know what I'm talking about, but we need an attitude adjustment. And I think somebody coming into the space like this, a student, a new grad, somebody with fresh energy, it would be amazing. It would blow up at least within the profession. Do you think that the a little bit of the joking, you know, playfulness of Bob and Brad, they kind of do that a little bit, like they kind of like make fun of each other, right? Yeah, yeah, they they do it in a different way, um, yeah. and it's relatable in the way that they do it, and that's why patients love it. Yeah. Uh, recently, I uh, I posted or I tweeted some like I, I'll tweet pictures of like my therapist treating their their patients, and there was one of my wife Annie, and she was doing like. Um, T-spine, thoracic spine mobs of a patient that obviously gave consent for the picture. And, yeah. and the client is on their, their yoga mat, like in the apartment. Um, and so someone, is, I forget, like UK or some other therapist, some physio, whatever, somewhere around the world, you know, like said, like, you know, manual therapy needs to be done, you know, skin to skin and, you know, not over shirt or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, like, the the patient is not going to take her shirt off to have a picture go on social right. media with your bra or whatever. It's like, it's for the picture. Now, also, I said, also, like, I manip a lot of thoracic spines right through a t-shirt. Like, it's not that hard. Um, and so that's part of, I think, what holds us back and the issue and the challenge with, with healthcare or physical therapy is that if a new grad puts out stuff like this, they're going to get annihilated with com with comments and, you know, you're doing it wrong and your attitude is poor and no one's going to want to hire you or whatever. Um, I think that's what holds a lot of folks back, whether it's in healthcare or outside of healthcare, but specifically in physical therapy. Because if you post something on Twitter, you, Instagram, whatever, there's some group that's saying, like, where's the research? Um, I don't want to go too long on a tangent, but even when I posted my, my fitness, my flexing uh, picture... And there was some, I forget where she's from, or if she's even a, a PT or if she's just like a PhD or whatever. She was asking me for research around, you know, do patients really perceive, do, or do you have research around patients' perception around the health and wellness of their healthcare provider in, in relation to charging out of pocket? I'm like, I didn't even reply, I didn't even tweet back. But like, for me, it's like, my proof is my bank account because I've seen how it works for us. Right. And I've seen some of my therapists that are a little rough around the edges and guess what? They don't have full plans of care. And then I have some of my other therapists that are fit and healthy and looked apart and they rock it and people want to continue to work with them. I know that's, that's long winded, but uh, jump back in here, Tony. This is what makes it such an appealing opportunity. This is what makes it such low hanging fruit because the system is so easy to game. Their buttons are so big. Remember the staples, you know, you push the button, that was easy their <laughs> buttons are so incredibly big to push. And there's nothing I love more than somebody who intentionally pushes a button like that just to get somebody riled up, who is also very intelligent, knows exactly what they're doing, knows exactly why they're doing it, and very calculated. Was it Nick Huber, I think you referenced, um, who puts out you know one tweet that blows up and gets hundreds of millions of views. It, it's not cruelty, it's not, you're not doing something just to be inflammatory, well, kind of, you, you're literally saying, look, this is absurd. We are over indexing on the dumbest stuff 
Nobody cares. You care. I don't care that you care. You care about it. But the ultimate person that we should be talking about is the patient. And what gets the patient better? What makes them feel better? What's achieving their goal? I don't care if you get your feathers in a, a bunch, you know, and um, I do think there's a huge opportunity for some serious button pushing. But it ha and, and like you said, it's not going to be somebody who's insecure. It's not going to be somebody who's afraid of criticism. It's going to be the person who is seeking that out and knows that every one of those comments and angry, you know, thumbs down is going to be money in the bank and it's going to grow their personal brand. I mean, it, we, it, we it see takes, it. It takes. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm done. It, it takes it, it takes it takes thick skin, though. Like you yeah. had some you know, comments on you've had some ridiculously negative comments on something very benign over the years. And, uh, and, and for me, when I was kind of, you know, poking the bear and, 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 uh, drumming up the hornet's nest, like I knew I was ready for that, but I also like, I've been around the block. I have thick skin, whatever. If a new grad is putting out stuff, you're right. They do need to have the self-awareness around like, Hey, you're going to get some negative comments. Like you have to be prepared for it. Maybe there's a game plan around like exactly what you're putting out. Don't let it deflate you. Keep putting it out, that type of stuff. But yeah, they, they have to have the, the playfulness, the, the understanding of like what they're putting out and knowing like if in this example that that's kind of interesting tony like they they have to they know that they're not a master clinician so imagine a therapist putting out content when they know they're not a master clinician oh it, it could it could starve a lot of attention but it could yeah. also grow their platform and then magically like patients are going to reach out and say hey i i want to you know i want to work with you just because of these videos and but they're not going to be the the best clinician in town Right, right. Uh, so, so the last YouTube channel that I want to share, and then today's episode, kind of weaving that thread through it, is really about that personal brand. These resources that no, people aren't really thinking about. Um, the guy's name is Jared Williams. It's spelled J E R E D. So he's a plumber. His business is in Alaska. I think we could learn a lot from analyzing and studying how service professional trades work, uh, electricians, plumbers, any of those businesses. And so he's got an amazing YouTube channel. It's relatively new. It's growing. I love his shorts. I watch every single one of his shorts. Everything that he says resonates so deeply with me. And, and as you can expect, I mean, his main direction is like some of the things that he says is he really only wants to help or work for rich people. And it's not, you know, anything negative or against poor people is that when he helps somebody replace a toilet and they're on a fixed income, they generally complain about everything. Whereas when he's helping somebody who's wealthy, their time is worth more than the $600 he's charging to replace the toilet or 800 or 1200. And, and they're usually happy and they're content. And I see that in the clinic. I'm sure you see it as well. You've got individuals that, you know, put a different value on money and put a different value on time. One of the best uh, podcasts I heard recently was a CEO from India. I can't remember what company, but he owns, uh, or he was a CEO of Cred, one of the original founders. They've processed 20% of all credit card transactions in India. He said in India, they will fight because they have a different perception of the value of time they could be earning hundreds of dollars an hour, but they'll still fight for a $10 discount that could take them an hour on the phone because they don't value that hour of their time the way we do here in the US. And so I know for me, I'm always gonna pay more if you save me time. I'm always gonna pay more if I don't have to double check your work. Yeah, like I'm always gonna pay more for the convenience and the reliability. Um, I am happy to pay 30, 40, 50% more if I get those things, because those things are more important than anything else. Have you seen Jared's channel? I have not. I need to check it out. Yeah, check it out. He talks about, and, and he reminds me a lot of you. He goes through numbers. He's like, how do you figure out your true cost? You and I have talked on this channel multiple times. Um, therapists who have small owner operator businesses, my business, if I actually treated it like a business and less than a, less like a hobby, I'm not profitable. If I had to pay somebody to do all of the things that I inherently do, there is no chance I could run a profit because I'd be paying somebody to do marketing in YouTube. 
I'd be paying for somebody to open the doors in the morning. I'd be paying somebody to hire and fire. I'd be paying somebody to do all of the order paper towels when my clinic runs low. You know, I could not afford to do all those things. And if I went to a therapist, a straight W-2 therapist, and I said, hey, I want to hire you as a physical therapist. I'm going to pay you 95000 a year. Oh, and you're also going to do all of these other things that I, as the therapist slash business owner do, they would never do it because it's like a $500,000 a year job. It's not a $100,000 a year job. But Jared, Jared Williams, check out his channel. Um, amazing content, great business ideas. Do you have anything you wanted to share before we wrap up? Uh, I, I like the Caitlin Clark post. Uh, I'm glad that you shared that and, and we brought that on and, and riffed on that. Um, I think that there's a ton of opportunities. And I think, again, tying that back in with what you're just saying around if you hired out all those roles and responsibilities, like let's just say you had a great, you know, a player for those roles. Like, let's say in the next week or two, you're hiring, you're interviewing folks and you hire out all those types of folks to fill those roles. You're saying you would not be profitable. So you would need more cash on the back end to cover those salaries. Is that kind of what you're saying? Kind of. Basically what it means and, and the way I look at it is, um, I would need more scale, right? I would need more size. Like when we were at our biggest, we were at five clinic locations. When I have five clinics generating revenue, I had enough revenue to pay somebody to do marketing, to pay somebody to do, you know, ordering and accounts receivable, to pay a biller, biller in-house, to do all of the things that need to be done for the business. And my Florida, I had three Florida locations that genuinely ran independent of me. I was not doing those daily activities. So that at that size, we had enough revenue to make that happen. But when I talk to a single owner operator, especially a mobile therapist, but even a brick and mortar clinic, um, or me at this stage right now, two small clinics, very low volume, very like light schedule, I don't have the revenue to support a real business. My business right now is more of a job than a real business because of that. But if I wanted it to be a real business, I grow the size. I get to 10 locations, 20 locations. I have revenue in the multiple millions. Now I can support hiring all of those positions. So, I mean, I know we're getting to the end here, but uh, maybe that could be another topic in the near future of like what type of game plan uh, like, how do you foresee your practice operating in the next, you know, three, five, 10 years? Or have you even thought about that? 100%. And I don't. I've, I've shared it publicly a lot. Um, unless some, okay, so I would say the one event that would really cause me to keep a physical therapy practice going for another decade would be a major seven figure payday. If I had something in one of my other projects that put a million dollars in my bank account, in a, in a heartbeat, I would keep my physical therapy cl clinics going. As long as my staff wanted to stay, I'd pay them. I don't care if they're profitable. I don't care what they're doing. I wouldn't even care to charge insurance or my patients for the, the you know therapy services we're delivering. To me, none of it has any value. I know that's hard for therapists to hear, but it's true. Like, I just don't care. I love the experience. I love being in the clinic. I love talking to the patients, the social engagement, but I would love it if we were in a bar. I would love it if we were in a park. I, it doesn't have to be physical therapy. I'm not married to those two words. Um, so if I hit a big payday in a heartbeat, I'd keep the clinics open. I'd let it run, you know, without worrying about profitability. Uh, if I don't, assuming I don't, when my staff leaves, I don't see myself replacing that staff. That staff is amazing. They're, they're simply amazing. And I have no interest, you know, in trying to replace them, trying to build a new culture, trying to keep that going for the little bit of profitability that's still there. I've already replaced that profitability with online resources. The only reason I keep the business going today is because I love my team. My team makes a good income from the money generated by the clinic. And I love my patients. I've got the same patients for over a decade. They come back from multiple episodes of care 
every single year, I don't have to market. I don't have to hustle. I don't have to go to random 5Ks unless I'm running in them. Th that's my, you know, that's where I am today and into the future. What about you? What are you thinking? What am I thinking about my situation or your yeah, situation? Your business, your business, your family, all the stuff that's going on. Yeah, well, I mean, we're we're speaking to a few different practice owners, and and one's a really interesting deal. I I hope that we can uh, potentially uh, we're talking about either the end of this month or no, the end of May, potentially putting in an offer, and and most likely uh, we're going to get close to that or or do that. Um, and I would love for uh for this to happen. It's gr it's got great margins. Um, and if it happens, Tony, if this if this deal happens, I I can't give too much information about it, but um, if, if, and when it happens, I'm going to, I, I'm kind of thinking like, I want to almost have like a D rock, uh, follow me like, and, and talk to the seller and me and we'll do interviews. Like, why did you sell to us? Was this fair? Were we too hard on negotiations? Me, uh, going out, uh, to, to these locations, uh, speaking to the therapist, like the whole transition process, I would I want to put a whole bunch of content around that. So we're still looking to partner and and acquire clinics. Um, there are some clinics that are razor thin margins and just not operated properly, and then there's some that have like really cushion, really solid margins, and like they're businesses as opposed to like like you're saying like a hobby or or, or a, a traditional practice that's. Um, not a business. Um, the one that, you know, a few that we're looking at, but one specifically, uh, it, it really gets us excited. It gets my, my team members and my board excited. They're, they're interested in it. So that's kind of what's going on with me. Um, in, in terms of the current practice concierge pain relief, um, looking to continue to grow that hire more therapists and there's more opportunity for us to grow in the whole, you know, concierge home visits with, the out of network insurances and, and the private pay. Um, and really quick, I was listening to, you probably saw this, Tim Ferriss and, uh, and Sean Purry on yeah. my first yeah. And that uh, there was so, a couple of things that Tim Ferriss mentioned, but one thing was like, when Tim Ferriss is going to go speak somewhere, it's either free or super premium. And I know you've talked about this before, but it's like with our home visits, it's like maybe it makes sense for us to continue to push the limit on the price. Like I said, on the top of the show, like, you know, we're charging kind of, you know, 250 to 400 range and then more or 400 or 500 bucks a visit if it's weekends. Um, maybe there's more growth opportunities there for us to continue to push the limit on the cost per visit and be super premium as opposed to like Luna who accepts every insurance and they don't care about being profitable. And it's almost not free, but it's almost it's low cost for the, the patient or client. Uh, so that's what's uh, stirring around right now in my head. That's it. That's exactly. I, I, I know the clip. Exactly. I copied that clip. I was going to share it on my Facebook feed. I just haven't cut the edges of it yet. Um, that is exactly it. It's look, stop, stop. Uh, what, what's the saying? Picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, you know, stop struggling for scraps. Even if Medicare turned around tomorrow and raised rates by 10%, never going to happen, but who even cares? Nobody is going to see an extra $10 a visit, like make them independently wealthy. The reality is, and, and this is going to be my parting shot. Think about yours. The reality is as therapists, we understand the most fundamental principle is we need excess capacity in the system. I need strong. I need to be stronger than I need to be to do the things that I want to do to reduce my chances of injury and to perform at my highest level, right? I need excess capacity. It's the same in finance. I need more money in my bank account, more money coming in than I ever would possibly need to give me the freedom and the independence to do the things that I want to do without stressing about stressing out about money and finance. What's your parting shot? Uh, parting shot is uh, the awesome analogy that you provided. You you shared online that the whole Caitlin Clark thing with the low salary for WNBA, kind of the equivalent of, you know, compressed salaries with healthcare and physical therapy. And even though I unfollowed Grant Cardone and I don't follow Grant Cardone anymore, do you know who Grant Cardone is? I do, very well. Okay, so, so I, I don't follow him anymore, I used to, but he's, he's, got, he's very popular in certain ways and he's got very funny uh, quotes and, and quips. And one thing that he says is, 
who's got my money? Who's got my money? Where is it? Right. So if you're a physical therapist, you know, you have these compressed salaries, you got inflation, you got practices that have compressed reimbursement or shrinking reimbursement that can't really pay you what you're worth. Who's got your money? You know, maybe it's maybe it's uh, Biofreeze, Lululemon, uh, these tech startups, these AI tech startups, whatever. Like, who's got your money? It's out there somewhere. Um, but if you don't go out there and create some noise, create videos, create, you know, whatever, like you have to get out there and provide value to the marketplace, um, then you can get that, those things that you say that you're worth, but you're not worth whatever you think you're worth just because you have student loan debt or a DPT. You got to put out stuff to generate value, show that you have value, and then you might get some transfer of that value in the future. Absolutely. I love it, Dave. As always, thank you so much. If you guys are still watching, go subscribe to the Dave Kittle Show and find us here Tuesday, Thursday morning, 8.30 a.m. Eastern. We'll catch you on the next episode. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E, painrelief.com or you can call me at any time, 646-781-8884.